The Kentucky Department of Agriculture is in the process of administrating an industrial hemp research pilot program that was enabled by the 2014 Farm Bill. Now, whenever you're talking hemp in Kentucky, it's a totally different animal than talking hemp or cannabis or anything else in other states. Uh, and the reason I say that is we've taken a much different approach because of the laws that we're under. Uh, it's important to note everything that the Kentucky Department of Agriculture is doing is in full compliance with both state and federal law. And so what that means is our project participants don't have to worry about the DEA and things like that. Uh, and so we're bound by law, we have to follow it as a state department, we can't just do whatever we want to. And so that's a clear distinction with other states. Other states have cannabis related laws that are in defiance of federal authority, ours are in uh, alliance with federal regulations. Uh, so that's something important to note on how we're doing things. And what I'm going to do to begin with is talk a little bit about that. Uh, you have a summary in front of you that we passed out before, or most of you do have. We did run out of copies since there ended up being more than we anticipated. I'm not going to uh, belabor that. You can look over it at the end. If you have any specific questions, feel free to ask. But we had about 20 growing locations last year and a little over 33 acres. So a modest start. Uh, I will very much echo what Dr. Williams said. Last year was not about generating information. It was about generating familiarity. Uh, with the hurdles we had to overcome with seed and other elements, it's not the type of program that could generate hard data. When you're looking at variety trials and things like that, you need years of data before you can make any sort of conclusive statements. That's why every year uh, or every other year you see recommendations coming out of University of Kentucky for all your major agronomic crops because new varieties come on the board, you've got to test those. And it's a lengthy process because you do want to have a variety of weather conditions. In the perfect world, over a five-year period, you see drought years, wet years, and average years, because you want to see how different varieties perform, uh, no matter what the climate is like that year. So just keep that in mind that we're under a very limited time frame with the Farm Bill, and we're not going to answer every question in that limited time frame, but we'll have a great base to begin with. Okay. We... I think operate sometimes under a misconception with some parts of the public. Uh, people will come to us thinking they can just apply and grow. First off, it's a research pilot program and what that functionally means is we do not do licenses, we do not do permits. So you can't just apply. Uh, Doug Fine, I think when he was speaking, I think he actually said Kentucky was a right to grow state. We are not a right to grow state. Uh, if you look at the Kentucky regulations, they're very different than anything like that, and I'm going to touch on those somewhat. Very, you've heard the summary. Jonathan Miller, I think, did an excellent job. But Senate Bill 50 was the state-level bill that became the regulations we're operating under with the state. And in some total, just some of the highlights, it defined industrial hemp to be distinct from marijuana, which is very important, called for research, established the Industrial Hemp Commission, called for the creation of a license program for growers, uh, and then numerous other elements associated with that. So specifically when it comes to defining industrial hemp, it specifically changed the Kentucky Revised Statute, or KRS, to say that the term marijuana does not include industrial hemp as defined by KRS 260.850. So if you go to 260.850, you start getting into the nitty gritty of it. Here it does define it, and it means all parts and varieties of the plant cannabis sativa, blah, 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 that contain a tetrahydrocannabinol concentration of no more than that adopted by federal law. Okay, first off, Kentucky state regs do not define the THC level. It's federal. Uh, and here's the reference to that. So that's important. So point three is still from the federal regs, not from our state regs. Additionally, again, it's kind of a circular reference, but in this section they again make the reference that industrial hemp is excluded from the definition of marijuana. So what that means at a state level, if you're meeting the federal definition of industrial hemp, you're dealing with industrial hemp, not marijuana. And that's really important for a couple of reasons, including commerce and some other things that have come up today. So again, it's not marijuana, 
it did not specify the THC threshold, but it did point to the federal threshold as the governing authority. And again, nowhere in that Senate Bill 50 or any of the associated attachments was any allowance for growing without federal action. Specifically, 268.65 is titled Mandatory Adoption of Federal Rules and Regulations Regarding Industrial Hemp. Now, sometimes government ease gets complicated, but that's a fairly straightforward title. And to me, the uh, takeaway is number two. It says nothing in KRS 260.85 to 260.869 shall be construed to authorize any person to violate any federal rules or regulations. So nothing in Senate Bill 50 could allow you to do something that was still considered illegal at a federal level. So today, is industrial hemp allowed at a federal, at a federal level? No, it's still considered marijuana for all intents and purposes with one big exception. And that exception is why we're all here today. The changes at the federal level happened with the Farm Bill, Section 7606. What it did is it allowed, in essence, state departments of agriculture to create research pilot programs. And there's several requirements associated with that. And that's why we're here, that's what we're doing. We have a Farm Bill established program to research industrial hemp, plain and simple, straightforward. We think, all right, with the passage, we have success. We're growing industrial hemp. But as you already heard, uh-oh, nobody mentioned seed in 7606. Now, to an average normal thinking human being, if you tell someone you can research X, it makes sense that you can import X into the country in order to do it. That's pretty straightforward. But we're talking about government regulation. So logic and basic understanding don't always work well. And so we ran into a conundrum. We were there raring to go, had the seed ordered, had it shipped in. Part of the reason we ended up with 13 varieties of Italian hemp is because not everybody wants to sell to you when they think you're illegal. Of course, we are legal, but sometimes it's hard to convince people. So what happened? We had a court case. And at the end of the day, what was interesting, if you go back and start Googling and looking at articles, you'll see some uh, statements from the department where after the seed was seed, they said, we're working together with the DEA, we're going to have this resolved in a couple of days, and then we're moving forward. A couple of days passed, and then we had to file a lawsuit. And basically what it came down to is DEA said, you have to be a registered importer of narcotic substances. It would be the same thing as if we wanted to manufacture uh, a pharmaceutical drug that was a narcotic. We could import it, manufacture it, and sell it. So basically, it's the same exact license that they would use. And so basically the department said, okay, we'll do that. No big deal. All it is is paperwork. And in all honesty, that's all it is. Uh, the problem was DEA said, oh, and by the way, it's gonna take several months for that to happen. And so they were by de facto preventing last year from happening. And so that's why there was the court case. That's why we had to take that action. Uh, there was an attempt with the department to work it out because again, we're bound to obey federal law. And so if federal law says we have to have a permit, great, let's do the permit. Ultimately what came out of it, the judge said, okay, you all do need to do a permit. And he told the DEA, you all should be able to get that done in two weeks. And that's what happened. And so we now have a well-established process by which we apply for import permits to bring seed into this country. Uh, we do have to be the entity that does that or another entity that's a registered uh, importer. I'm not aware of any others in the state. Uh, there may be some others in the country, but again, they don't have the same relationship that we do with our pilot project participants. So can a private enterprise or a private individual participate in a research pilot program? This was another point of contention with the lawsuit. Ultimately, the decision was made yes. And again, the logic on it kind of works. We don't own farms. Our employees don't get paid to farm. So exactly how are we going to do farming research? And in fact, there's other federal programs, such as Cooperative Extension, that for years engages private citizens to do research at one form or at one level or another. 
So it's not outside of the realm of agriculture to even use private participants. And we actually have from the DEA a letter that in part states, the DEA will consider private growers who have executed MOUs with the KDA to be part of the KDA for the purposes of 7606. So what does that mean? DEA still doesn't believe private growers can participate in a 7606 research program. But as long as we enter into an MOU with you, you're no longer a private grower. You're now part of the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. So they still say no private growers and we still get to do what we want to do. And so that's an important point. Uh, sometimes we have folks that contact us, want to do a growing program or think it's an application program where they can just apply and then they're able to grow. It's not that easy. Uh, this year we had 326 applications come in in one month. Uh, those were all evaluated. They were read through every single one of them and we'll probably end up with around 120 MOUs issued. That's to both uh, growers as well as processors. So how did we arrive at 120? Part of it is management. Uh, we couldn't approve everybody that applied. We don't have the personnel to do it. The other part is what's the likelihood that a project is likely to be completed. So, you know, we had people that literally were from out of state who said, I will come to Kentucky, buy a farm and grow hemp. <laughs> yeah, those didn't exactly go in the yes pile automatically. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, we appreciate the enthusiasm. And, you know, since we're going to have to have action on a federal level, we really like that there's interest from all over. But realistically, that's not a research pilot program for our state, and that doesn't make good sense uh, from economically or agriculturally either one. We also had to consider what's going to happen to this hemp. Um, the logistics of this program has probably been the biggest thing it is. Which one comes first, the farms or the processing? And the truth is we got to try to grow both at the same time, and that's difficult. So we haven't approved acreage and acreage out there on speculation that maybe somebody will want to buy it. What we've done is linked growers to processors or to people that will further utilize it. And so we were limited on how many acres we could approve simply based on that fact. So it's been a complex uh, decision process that the committee had to go through to figure out which ones do we approve. Uh, we would like to approve them all. Uh, Commissioner Comer all along has said, you know, his end goal is that hemp becomes an agricultural commodity and your decision to grow it becomes, does it work economically for your farm or not? Not is it some sort of legal limbo that we have to wade through? The other thing that came up during today in part was marketing considerations or economics uh, and can we sell things? Um, 7606 does specifically mention marketing and again how can you do any sort of research related to marketing without sales uh, you can't have one without the other so uh, we actually have 7606 saying marketing is okay and then we have a letter from our Attorney General and I will say letter it's not a legal opinion uh, there is a dramatic difference between the two but this latter does say in reference to the farm bill, absent any federal guidance to the contrary, it, meaning the farm bill, appears to exempt hemp pilot programs from the Controlled Substances Act, allowing the sale of hemp in Kentucky by those programs. So we have uh, our highest legal uh, office in the state saying that we can sell hemp in the state. We have federal regulations that say we can enter into marketing. So it is the opinion of the Department of Agriculture that we can sell products over state line. And part of this gets complex because uh, there was already existing regulations that allow certain industrial hemp products to be sold over state lines. It's why we have Dr. Bronner's and Nutiva and all those companies already in existence. They're already moving hemp products in and out of the country, raw products into the country and finished goods out. Uh, so there were already certain allowances in federal law that discounted those type products from any uh, ramifications under the Controlled Substances Act. So we've got that that we're working under. 
We've got the authority within 7606 on marketing. And so we're very comfortable when we say that we'll be able to move products over state lines. Now, could the DEA disagree? Probably. Uh, just knowing the history of how we've got here, it's very likely. Uh, but the same department that's been willing to go to court to get the matter settled before is still working with you. So that's something that we're still willing to uh, have answered in the courts, and that's where it's ultimately going to fall. I think one of the problems in uh, Adam is moving seeds across state lines. Right. Even though we're certified, I mean, we can get seed from Colorado, yep. you know, vice versa. We are actually working right now internally to come up with uh, a protocol to look at moving seed in from other states. It would have to be able to demonstrate to us that it should comply with the 0.3% THC level. Uh, that's something that um, someone asked earlier or mentioned earlier about, you know, the way the, uh, some of the wording was, it was talking about certified seed. We don't have that, because again, that sort of language actually is in KRS, but it's not part of our industrial research pilot program. What we look at is some sort of substantiation that a seed source should meet the 0.3% THC. Uh, testing seed itself, the physical seed, is of no value. You're not gonna have a uh, high THC within that seed. Um, so what we would consider uh, acceptable proof, it would be things such as being listed as an allowed uh, cultivar on another country's list that has a similar or lesser THC limit than ourselves. Uh, if you can find in published research where it's showing THC limits uh, for that particular variety. Uh, things of that nature. If it's coming out of another uh, state's research program where they do testing and this crop was tested and it met the requirements, we'd be okay with that. So it doesn't literally have to be a certified variety. In truth, I don't know what the phrase certified variety means because there's so many different certifications and possibilities there. That's just ambiguous language, it doesn't help. So again, we just need some sort of representation and a legitimate representation that it should meet the 0.3% THC. Anybody else have questions? Yeah.